Hello YouTube, hello everyone, and please welcome back my regular guest, Cookie Pirate. You have to promise not to molest us. Absolutely. Oh yes, I, I forgot about that, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and are you James? Hello there, this is James Asprop, you James 1978. Yeah, uh, so a couple of weeks ago, it was the Doctor talking about his vibrator, <laughs> and, and this week there's all this talk of molestation. And, uh, yes, well, hmm. Anyway, uh, without further ado, I'll do um, uh, the uh, synopsis and appraisal. Uh, we are discussing The Highlanders, written by Elwyn Jones and Jerry Davis, directed by Hugh David, produced by Innes Lloyd. I don't know if it's Innes Lloyd or Innes Lloyd. Um, in fact, I think that's a Welsh name, it should be Cloyd. Um, the double L. Anyway, synopsis. After the Battle of Culloden, the British army has triumphed over the rebel forces of uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie. The Doctor, Ben and Polly, are taken prisoner by Scottish rebels. They hide in a cottage with Laird Colin McLaren, who's been wounded, his daughter, Kirsty, his piper, Jamie McCrimmon, and his son, Alexander, who dies defending them from the English soldiers. Polly and Kirsty hide in an animal pit to avoid Lieutenant Finch, uh, whom they end up trapping and robbing. Later in Inverness, they run into him again and use his previous foolishness to blackmail him. Meanwhile, a shady character known as Grey is illegally enslaving Highlanders and shipping them to the colonies. Appraisal. Another completely missing story and the last of the pure historicals, this adventure introduces us to the new companion, Jamie. Something which very nearly happened. Uh, sorry, very nearly uh, never happened, as it was doubted he would work as a long-term character. Ironically, he goes on to be one of the longest-lived companions. Uh, in fact, uh, well, me and James discussed this. Technically, Jamie is the longest-running companion. He has the most minutes of any companion. Um, but actor Fraser Hines' contract was just for four serials. Michael Craze and Annie Key Wills initially resented him, feeling the show didn't need another companion, but soon they all got along. Not a bad story by any means, hard to judge when uh, none of it's live action, and perhaps the historicals were getting a bit stale at this point. The Troughton era, uh, era was very uh, deliberately distinct from the Hartnell era, taking us more into pure sci-fi, but this serial had already been planned. Something odd about this serial uh, is uh, the protagonists arrive after the Battle of Culloden. TARDIS, you had one job. So, anyway, Koki Pirates, your thoughts on this serial? Yeah, uh, I want to like the historicals. I mean, that's what particularly appealed to me about Classic Who, but um, I just wasn't really feeling this as much. And I feel bad because, well, okay, I guess he wasn't a pirate per se, but it had buccaneer-type characters, and I like pirates. Um, that he was a slaver, I guess. Or, what was his occupation? A smuggler of some sort? Was, oh, uh, are you talking about Grey or Trask? Grey, uh, was, the, Grey was the English solicitor who was appointed uh, commi High Commissioner of Prisons. So, you know, as he told his, uh, as he told his clerk, um, you know, I'm not just in this for the prestige. I'm looking for a way to turn a tiny profit. So he he was a lawyer, uh, uh, and uh, Trask was the uh, the former mate of the Annabelle, now the ship's captain. They they were originally pirates, remember, under the uh, Scottish captain. Not pirates, but smugglers. They were smuggling uh, weapons and. Smuggling weapons and soldiers for the Jacobite cause. So okay. they, tried, they were aiding the rebellion. So, you that, know, so, um, uh, so when okay. Trask took over the ship, Gray offered him a deal. He, I can, I have enough evidence to have you hanged ten times over, or you can work trading slaves for me. Yeah, that's the guy. Um, I was thinking, actually, that's probably what caught my interest the most out of this. It's like, oh, cool. Um, you know, because I like the buccaneer thing. I don't know if it's because if it's a retcon or her. Because I, I, there are historicals I like, but this one, I guess it couldn't really retain my attention that well. Um, and yeah, the Dr. Von Ware, is that like German for Doctor Who? Because 
Is that like an <laughs> ongoing joke? Yes, the, 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 English, the gruff English sergeant's joke at the beginning. Doctor, whatever his name is in German, I'm not going to even attempt to pronounce it. Doctor Who? That's what I said. <laughs> yeah. Nice. <laughs> uh, can I say, actually, I think one of the things that I would really have enjoyed about the serial, if it were live action, is the comedy with Troughton uh, playing different roles and doing different accents. I just think if it were live action, it would be it's my favourite It's almost bit. enough to make you think that he was a classically trained theatrical actor. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the accents were fun. I, 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 I like that. Aha, and uh, James, your appraisal of the serial. So, the on this is a bittersweet uh, serial for me, because first of all, uh, uh, to address this first, because it's something that appears to be overlooked, this is Polly's first true story. This is uh, the the first story in which she has an actual role. She's not just hiding away, being held hostage, or making coffee. <laughs> she, uh, her quote-unquote relationship with the Finch <laughs> is actually quite endearing in a weird sort of way. Um, but of course, the two main things. Firstly, the fact that it's the last pure historical that wasn't actually a historical. As you say, Alex, it, they arrive after the Battle of Culloden, the final, uh, the, the final deciding battle of the Jacobite Rebellion, uh, you know, the absolute last chance for the House of Stuart to uh, reclaim the English throne, you know, um, so after that, we ha so after that, yes, this was uh, th this was the establishment of parliamentary democracy. No, that never again would there be an absolute monarch. But on the other hand, this was when uh, the crackdown on Catholics became even worse <laughs> than it had been under absolute monarchs. You know, and only uh, last year was. Uh, the was the final law uh, abolished, meaning that uh, the the King of England is now allowed to marry a Catholic. You know, <laughs> that's how um, that's how deeply embedded anti-Catholic bigotry what uh, became around this period. But uh, either way, though, sticking with the story, it's, sticking with the story itself, uh, the main reason why they couldn't go there before or during the Battle of Culloden, obviously, was the budget. <laughs> so, I did wonder. Yeah, uh, there, there is no possible way that you could have a major battle on the BBC's budget or on the BBC's budget. Uh, uh, at the time, <laughs> you know, nowadays, uh, nowadays possibly you could have a massive CGI battle, or you could fake it somehow. But uh, I'll get to that point later. So instead, whilst it's set in, in a in an important historical period, it like uh, the smugglers. Whilst it makes references to history, it is a story on its own. So as, so as much as I adore the historicals, uh, the, particularly the earlier, well, particularly, um, think, oh, excuse me, I can't, the, the things like um, uh, the Massacre of St. Bartholomew's Eve, the three serials which were written by the same person, I can't, I'm trying to remember his name. Oh, John Lucarotti. John Lucarotti, thank you. The three serials written by him in particular were absolutely amazing. The French Revolution, we agree, was meh. And The Smugglers was just... Uh, <laughs> there was a perception filter over that entire, <laughs> that entire serial. 
But uh, again, like uh, like uh, Verity Lambert's vision of the Doctor as a kindly old grand, a grumpy old grandfather figure, uh, dispensing wisdom. The historicals uh, were part of the original concept of Doctor Who. It was uh, part of Sidney Newman's, uh, I believe that was his name, that, that was part of, of his original vision for the show, to make it educational for children. But by this point, three years into Doctor Who, starting with a new Doctor, um, like the concept of the Doctor as a grandfather, it it does genuinely seem that uh, it does genuinely seem as if uh, the the Doctor Doctor Who the series had outgrown the historicals. So yes, um, considering just how rubbish some of the quote unquote historicals actually were, and the budget limitations particularly meant that uh, all they could really have in most cases were um, fictional stories set in historical periods. Yes, perhaps it was time to let the historicals go. Uh, and not that uh, the Doctor doesn't ever visit history again, it's just uh, from this point on, it's impossible uh, to visit a, a historical figure without there being a 20-foot tall uh, blind space turkey <laughs> or giant killer bees. <laughs> Dangerously close to the job, but okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, <coughs> excuse me. So, yes, the last... The last pure historical, which wasn't actually his, uh, historical, uh, oh yes, I've already mentioned the fact that this is but Polly's first true story, and Fraser Hines as Jamie McCrimmon. You know, uh, Stephen Taylor, portrayed by Peter Purvis, let's try saying that three times fast, was my second favourite male companion. And now we see Jamie, which is, um, which, which, as you pointed out in your appraisal slash synopsis, Alex, is quite weird because nothing throughout the story ever indicated that he was going to be a new companion. He was literally just a bit part character until at the very end well he stayed behind you know he could have just as easily gone on the ship but he stays behind in scotland for no apparent reason and well we can't leave him here do you want to come with us <laughs> and of course, remember this is 1745 people are still being burned as witches and oh by the way we've got a magical box that can travel through time and space <laughs> Yeah, it, it is, but there's no companion sense tingling in, in no, this one. And when I originally very... saw the series, when I originally saw all of classic Who for the first time uh, last November, there was there was nothing to indicate that he would be a companion. And as you say, he was only contracted for four serials, but went on to become the longest serving companion in Doctor Who history. So it's just one of it's just another one of those great ironies of Doctor Who, especially since, according to Peter Purvis, the powers that be had decreed that uh, companions would only stick around for a year, <laughs> a law which apparently didn't apply to uh, didn't apply to Highlanders. <laughs> Yes, and uh, uh, Jamie is still very much a remembered, very much loved um, companion. Uh, uh, I, do, I do believe he's still with us. He is indeed still with us, yes. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I mean, he will go on to shine. I know it's it's a bit sort of odd, because he's he's a professional bagpiper. Yeah. And the lead has his own personal bagpipe. Uh, actually, sorry, seriously, bagpipes kilts. It says they wanted the most stereotypical Scottish character imaginable. Well, not really, because that is historically accurate. 
just as uh, an English lord would have his entourage, his servants, etc., for a Scottish laird to have his own piper, particularly in battle. Remember, bagpipe, uh, some Scottish people who are listening, if this is... uh, if if this is um oh, what's the word an ac- not, not anachronous apocryphal apocryphal thank you if this is apocryphal if it's something that uh, the elves wouldn't pick up on qi and would pass off as fact do please let me know but bagpipes weren't just musical instruments they were used as signals in battle the depending on the tune or rhythm that the piper was playing that was the right. that was the signal to attack, retreat, advance, flank, what have you. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. So for a for especially in battle, for a lord to have his own piper was <laughs> it wasn't just a prestige thing. It was part, as far as I'm aware, it what it was part of the military strategy. But as this. As uh, they pointed out at the very beginning of the serial, the Battle of Culloden, the the Highland, the surviving Highlanders, uh, the, the the remnants of uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie's rebel army were cut down by the English guns before they ever had a chance to get within Claymore's length of of the Redcoats. <laughs> you know, so, it's kind of funny like hearing that he's going to be a companion for such a long time because i'm assuming that he becomes more memorable in other oh, serials oh, a- in this absolutely. one absolutely as as i say in this one he was literally just a bit part character the only scene of any notes or um relevance is the comedy scene when uh the doctor is using the backward beliefs of the period to try and convince them that no bloodletting would be stupid by looking up at the stars through his telescope and saying, no, 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 he can't be bled until Taurus is in the ascendance. That's the only real dialogue between them. But no, um, Jamie is going to go on to be one of the most... uh, likable one of the most lovable but at the same time one of the, you know oh we, we talked about uh ben's sexism and uh what have you in the uh, previous podcasts J- jamie mccrimmon being a scottish highlander from 1745 is sexist in the most likable way possible <laughs> It's not so much that you forgive him; it's that it's it's done in a comedy fashion. Uh, it's what it's one of the little kind of com. It's one of the little comedy aspects which uh, will go on to mark the Trout and Serial. Not so much making fun of or making light of, but just a little bit of comic relief here and there to break up the drama. <laughs> okay. Um, now I'm just remembering, there was like, Ben had some kind of cockneyism that, I can't remember what it was, though. There was something he said that I'm like, what is this? Oh, is it Geezer? No, it wasn't Geezer. We've had had Geezer, we've had China, or me old China, that was last week was China. I can't think what, um, uh, what particularly cockney thing he said this week. Yeah, I guess I'd have to watch it again. No, I don't. I don't think he said anything particularly Cockney. Hmm. Uh, and I, I could be have... misremembering. I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, oh, uh, oh, what was the Scottish term? I actually uh, looked it up on Wiki. Sassanac. That's it. It's a derogatory Gaelic uh, yeah. term for English scum. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. Yes, Sassanac, and and um, I know because uh, I can I, sometimes Americans use redcoat as an insult against the English as well. It's quite fun. We're still the redcoats, um, yes. but um, but yes, um, that was uh, Jamie as a companion. 
I did want to address uh, particularly, uh, even though obviously we haven't really come to, to appreciate the Jamie character yet, as, as we've touched upon. But a few weeks ago, of course, I remember Koki mentioning, um, you know, companions from the past, which knew who hasn't done at all. And if you don't count Katarina, then Jamie is the first historical companion. Yeah. So we're, we're finally there. <laughs> well, uh, as a, the first one of the only, really, because um, there are compan- in Classic Who, there are companions from the future, there are companions from alternate universes. <laughs> Yeah. There are Maori Australians trying to get to Heathrow. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've actually just realised, of course, because coming up, without wanting to spoil it too much, but coming up is an era when we will only have historical companions. We'll have two companions from different eras. Oh, yeah. Oh, of course. Smack me, I... smack me in the head and call me Susan. Uh, do they <laughs> do they um do it well though? Like, is there um stuff like they may not know stuff that we're familiar with? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yes. Uh, try trying to explain the concept of trains to Jamie uh-huh. because because uh, Victor- Victoria is Victorian, no pun intended. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Jamie lived in an era when uh, the train was only just literally being invented. It wouldn't have even reached... There was no chance of it reaching the Highlands until uh, the mid-1800s. So it was about 100 years too early for him. So, yes, trying to explain the concept of trains to Jamie... Uh, you know, uh, there is a wonderful scene um, uh, in one of my favourite serials, The Dominators, where two aliens are examining his brain. Crude, primitive, some evidence of a rapid learning. <laughs> you know, mm. Because you're taken from 1745 into all of these future and alien worlds, of course you're going to have to pick things up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's actually, now I think about it, I haven't seen these for a while, but yeah, we, we've got a fun era ahead of us. Oh yes, um, as I say, uh, well, one of the things about the Troughton era, it's it's comical, you know, <laughs> one of my favourite scenes of all time, the, the TARDIS has landed on its side, to which you hear the, to- the doors open, and you hear uh, Jamie, Victoria, and the Doctor all struggling and pushing and uh, climbing on top of each other. Troughton's head drags, manages to drag himself out of the heart TARDIS. Will you hurry up, Doctor? Why? Because you're standing on my head! <laughs> ah! <laughs> uh, yes, and, and Jamie's accent, which... Uh famously does soften, because apparently a lot of people didn't understand the, the true Highland accent, so it becomes a bit more... Oh, yes. Uh, the whole Highland thing, aside from the fact that uh, he is... Aside, aside from the fact that he is always wearing his kilt, and uh, every, any time he's running into a fight, he's, he yells the uh, Gaelic battle, battle cry, Gragatoa. Uh, aside from that, the Scottishness is softened considerably. <laughs> mm. <laughs> oh, um, so, um, reining this in a bit, Koki, uh, so basically, like with the smugglers, you know, you like pirates and things, but they, the, 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 it didn't really grab you as, as a serial. Yeah, Nothing particularly like cringe worthy. There was nothing I didn't like, but yeah, I don't know. It could be like retcons, but uh, it just wasn't holding me. Ah, uh, yeah. I, unfortunately, well, this is the worst hit season, um, so uh, we will we, we'll we'll get through this um, and, and to uh, to an era where there's more kind of live action stuff. I've actually, I've found out more recently about the, because there's actually conflicting things that you hear about the quote-unquote junking. My understanding has always been that it was um, 
that the BBC went into colour and thought that uh, it wasn't worth keeping black and white stuff for prosperity. Of course, what they didn't predict uh, was home video, that they could sell these to people and make some money because people would go, no, shut up and take my money and, and get them on VHS. Um, and um, uh, somebody uh, I heard recently said uh, that one part of the BBC thought that another part of the BBC had them. Um, and uh, there's one other account, I can't remember what that was, but there's conflicting stuff about that. And actually, while we're on facts and figures, ah, oh, damn, I closed the window. Damn it, I'll do it next week. Because there, there, there's been a poll recently of, um, of uh, you know, most popular serials, how popular serials from each season are. And uh, it would have been fun to go through the seasons we've done so far, but um, uh, I can wait till next week. Um, so, I yeah, guess... So, I, no, I bet you good money um, the serials I love are going to be the least popular. That's the way it always works. I was <laughs> disappointed how low the Savages ranked. Well, the Savages is like second from the bottom. Oh, yeah. don't... Do we need a Steven Taylor being... A tragically and criminally overlooked jar. <laughs> uh, but uh... okay, well, I'll just open up the floor if anyone has anything to add. Uh, the st- uh, the story of um, the Highlanders is much better, much more memorable than uh, the smugglers. As I say, the smugglers had a, had a member of the silence in every scene. You know, well, oh, no, no, it couldn't have had, otherwise I would have destroyed my laptop. Uh, <laughs> indeed, indeed. Oh, uh, but... Um, uh, no, it had a perception filter on it. But no, this one is a good, solid, well-done story in itself. It is so wonderful to finally see Polly coming into her own, taking charge and actually doing something constructive to save everyone. I honestly thought when I saw the serial, that, uh, talking about forgettable, I honestly thought when I first saw the serial that Kirsty, the laird's daughter, who spends uh, the entire serial with Polly, I thought that she was going to be the new companion. But no, it's the Piper <laughs> who only really has one memorable scene. <laughs> uh, maybe it's just fate. Yeah. Maybe it's pure chismic. Uh, again, it's, it's just one of those great paradoxes which seems to, uh, which seems to uh, def- define Doctor Who. Uh, everyone thought that the Daleks were going to be a massive failure. They were and still are the greatest, most iconic success. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, nobody thought Jamie was going to be a long-running companion. He is the long-running companion. Everyone thought that, oh, it'll last for a few years until Hartnell retires. We're in the 51st year. <laughs> Fifty seconds now that the, the um, anniversary has passed. Mm-hmm. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's just one of those weird things you plan. You plan for something, and the opposite turns out to be true. I suspect that um, it was a contractual thing that um, Fraser Hines was available to sign a contract for four serials, and uh, maybe they would have had Kirsty as another companion. Um, which would be a very different dynamic. Uh, but in any case, um, this actually, talking about um, Kirsty, um, brings me on to an ex- uh, a sort of extra round that I want to add, where everyone says their high point and low point. I'm going to say my high point would be the comedy with um, the Doctor playing different roles, doing different accents, if it were live action. I'm, I'm instead going to say that just the fact that it does introduce Jamie... Uh, is my favourite thing. My low point, and I'm surprised no one mentioned this, because yes, it's a strong story for Polly in certain respects. I am not alone in thinking that Polly isn't very nice in this. That she's very rude, very snobby. Doesn't she call Kirsty a dirty little peasant or a stupid little uh, peasant? Yeah. Uh, that again, um, the the whole Arab. 
It's the whole arrogant, stuck-up English thing. It's one of those things that you're not nece- you don't necessarily forgive, the whole Duchess thing, but it's just an aspect of her... It's just an aspect of her character, really. <laughs> um, yeah. So, it's... Again, it's... The fact that... Yeah, oh, it's like... Um, the actress who played Verity Lambert in the docudrama An Adventure in Time and Space. Uh, the way. Je- uh, but, uh, but her role as Verity Lambert put it to, in order to be the lone woman fighting against the patriarchal, the patriarchal institutionalism of the BBC, they had to show her as being bossy and bitchy and rude to a barman for no reason. I think that this was simply overcompensation on the part mm. of both the writers and the actress uh, to try to try and make up for the fact that yes, in the tenth planet, she was literally serving coffee. So now she is determined to save her friends, and if all that this uh, Scottish uh, this Scottish girl wants to do is sit around crying, then to hell with her. <coughs> yeah. Um, Pokey, your high point and low point? Um, high point, I guess, uh, hmm. I liked Polly and that girl's back and forth, um, just in general. Uh, but I did find Dr. Von Wid, you know, to be rather funny. But, um, no points. Hmm. Oh, I guess, um, on the ship, uh, I felt like things went on a little longer than they needed to. So, yeah. And, um, may the hamster of our freedom be upon your head. (laughs) Oh, yes, we made it all that time. Three quarters of an hour before someone made a Braveheart reference. <laughs> wow. And, oh, actually, yes, can I, can I change my high point to did not star Mel Gibson? <laughs> yes, uh, but unfortunately, that's a, uh, that's a few hundred years too late. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, James, your high point and low point. Oh, that's the thing. Um, for, uh, Jamie... It, it, no, Jamie arriving isn't join, joining the TARDIS crew isn't a high point of the the serial because, as we've already discussed, it, at, at this point he wasn't really a character at all. That's that's kind of a high point of the series. So yes, I will have to say that my high point is, uh, although although as I mentioned. It was overdone. They did just try to overcompensate for Polly's character, uh, making her pushy, bitchy, and even abusive, uh, ra- uh, rather than just strong and independent. As I say, overcompensating for it. Yes, she. That was the high point, and the low point. Uh, the. St- the absurdity of the comedy scene when uh, the doc when uh, the doctor has tricked and tied up Gray for the first time, tricking him with the uh, banner of uh, Charles Stu- Charles Edward Stewart, Bonnie Prince Charlie, and locked tied him up and locked him in the cu- cupboard to which the clerk comes in and says oh no no you must rest your eyes for an hour what's that banging oh there is no banging it's all in your head rest your eyes for an hour and it's and the banging will go away uh, it, there's there's absurdist comedy there's there's making fun of the buffoon the stooge in comedy and there's crossing the line. There really, there really is just taking the piss, uh, insulting our intelligence. So um, I'm happy to say that that's, I, as far as I can remember, there are no other quote-unquote comedy scenes 
in Troughton's era, which are that stupid, that over the top. But, oh yes, uh, talking about molesting, uh, going way back to the introduction, I just want to mention this before we wrap it up. Um, yeah, it's like ejaculation. <laughs> The man ejaculated from the third floor window. Yes. Uh, molestation, it just meant assault in those days. Now well, we're... um, I kind of figure that much, uh, I don't say in Spanish, molestar just means to bother someone. Yeah, so, so that's it. So today, molestation, in English, molestation is, uh, ju- is, uh, so, um, unconsciously tied with sexual molestation <laughs> that uh, yeah. that obviously it sounds different that uh, that obviously it sounds weird to us but uh, yes it it was a nice little hark back to the reality of living in 17 for uh, the reality of living in 1745 the language differences oh um the Prince Regent in Blackadder the Third. I'm a gay bachelor, Blackadder. Only two people laugh. The rest, <laughs> the rest realised that he meant gay as in happy. Thank you. Yes. That 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 is one of the high points of Blackadder because yes, the audience isn't twelve fucking years old. Aha, <laughs> uh-huh. and. On that bombshell, I guess it's... Oh, um, uh, excuse me. May the great holy donkey bless Frazier Hines' house for seven generations again. (laughs) Indeed. And I believe it's the underwater menace next week? Indeed it is. Uh Aha, which is another one that I don't know particularly well. Uh, Sadly, it's another missing one. Um, Does it include Aquaman or an Aquaman-like entity? Yes, it does. Uh-huh. This there pleases me. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah. Oh, no, so... Two, episodes two and three do still exist. Oh, okay. So it's only partially missing. Oh, right. Okay, excellent. And then I think we have another one that uh, that half exists. Yeah, two of uh, the moon base two and four. Uh, <laughs> ah. No, sorry, it's the... Ooh, you've arrived by time. Ta- you've ar- arrived suddenly without passports or any uh, identification, you must be the cause. And no, 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 we can't listen to you. Be- sorry, because we have to keep our facility running. Oh. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> All right, so if we, we've already jumped ahead to and we have a rant about the moon base. We haven't, uh, anyway. Right, but anyway, um, we will be, um, well, join us next time for the Underwater Menace. Oh.